Ali, Rashawn Ali, everybody's home girl, everybody's favorite soror, the cool soror, representing the ATL and the east side of the cater. What's happening? Five, four, three, three. Okay, here we go. It's the Cool Soar Podcast, hosted by me, Rashawn Ali. <laughs> Hey, 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 welcome to a very special edition of the Cool Store Podcast and show. I am your host, Rashawn Ali. And normally, I have great conversations with women and men in black Greek letter organizations. But today, I have a very special guest who has been on the show. Now, this is her third time. I'm like, okay. I don't know if anybody has actually been on the show three times uh, she was there when it was just an audio show. She was there in the first season of the video portion of the show. And now I was like, let's do something different. A lot of people know me from social media. And for those of you who are from Atlanta have known me from my radio career and Hawks career and CBS Sports Network and all the things that are on my resume. But, you know, those are the things that I show uh, the world. There's so much more to me. And I, there's very few people that I entrust with my life and um, actually interviewing me that I know will probably capture all of who I am. And that's no shade to anyone who has ever interviewed me, but there's a level of respect that I have for this woman who you are about to see and meet for some of you for the first time. Um, and she doesn't like all of this. We're both cancer, so when we celebrate each other, it's like a weird thing. So mm -hmm. she, like, literally is one of the best journalists I've ever encountered. Not only that, I met her as a producer on Sister Circle. Um, she is a member of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. She is a personality. Like, literally, she can do it all. She shoots, writes, edits. She has her own podcast, Oh, just a Thought with Sheree Nicole. Uh, she also hosts with Willie Moore Jr., a nationally syndicated show, but so much more. And she is a dear friend. So I, you know, my producer Nicole was like, we should get Sheree to interview you. Because they were both producers together at Sister Circle. And I was like, if anybody that can really bring it out of me all the way, it's Sheree Nicole. So I really hate long intros, and I always... When I'm when I'm listening to shows, I'm like, get to it, get to it. So I hope that you didn't do that because I needed to intro uh, the that I needed to intro her in that way. So please uh, welcome to the show my dear friend, my mentee, who's also my mentor, Sheree Nicole. <laughs> Thank you, guys. I was sitting there the entire time. Hurry Very up. Get to it. I'm tired. I know. I don't want to hear about it. me like that. I know. Ooh. Hey, Rashawn. Hi. You look fantastic. This Thank hair you. and this outfit and this makeup. Yes, Thank you. It's an I, honor. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. And we've talked about doing something like this yeah. for about a year or so. It had, yeah, yeah, it's been that long. And I told you, I said, Rashawn. I'm not going to do it unless you're really ready, ready, ready for it, right? To answer all my questions and be that open book that I that you've been with me. Yeah. That I not only think people are curious about, but they also deserve because mm -hmm. I know your story has so much breakthrough for folks that are gonna watch this Ooh. and listen to it. Right. And so, you know, I always want to attach myself to purpose. So this is a purpose-driven opportunity for us both yeah, to yeah. not only give you the floor and give people an opportunity to really get to know you more, but also for other people to get to know themselves more a bit as well. Facts. Fair? That's very so fair. You, that's, those are the rules. Those are the rules? Questions the need rules? answers. Okay. okay. I, I decided not to have champagne. I'm having La Croix. <laughs> So then make sure I hydrate myself. We're my even. Stuff. We're even. Because yes. I know you don't do that, which I love yeah. so much. Oh, I you know, I was like you in that area. No, 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 no. That's actually boring. <laughs> I look more up to you with the with the sparkling <laughs> the rosé and, and champagne and all, all that. But I, right. I had to keep it straight laced so I wouldn't forget stuff today. Absolutely. I love it. Because we got it. a lot to cover. Yes, we do. Okay. Yes. You ready? I'm ready. I'm okay. ready. I'm ready. I forgot. I'm being interviewed on my own show. Yes. <laughs> it's very strange. This is very different. It the is. pressure is on. But we're going to just woosah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And like I tell everybody, I was like, you know, trust me. I got you. I'm never going to put you out. You know, I always tell people, especially like folks who have been in the limelight yeah. for so long, yeah. like it, you're, it's a safe space. So I already know that. And that's why I was like, oh, I know who can do it. Well, let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. 
Okay, so you've mentioned trust like two or three times within the last probably 60 seconds. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you said in the intro is I don't trust most people, you know, to really express with openly in the way that I do with Cherie and some of the other people I'm close to. So why is that? Where was the distrust birthed? Because there are people that are just automatically in your face. Here's my story. Here's my testimony. I'm this person. But you have really you you have guardrails set up and I'm sure for a reason. But where was that birth for you? I don't know if there is a a, a type of distrust. I think that um, there's a level of as much as as open as I am in my life. Mm -hmm. There's a part that I have to keep to myself and also a part of me that. I don't say that I'm ashamed of, but like I deal. Like every single day I deal with my, and I don't like to call them demons because I don't do the whole um, uh, hell and, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't do that. Like mm-hmm. the devil, oh, the devil is a lie. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't do that. But I do have things that I struggle with every single yeah. day. And so there's a level of, am I really showing everybody, I don't want to show every, do I, do I need to show the world who I really am? Like, mm how insecure that I am at times, how weak I am at times, and with the things that I, I struggle with, like almost daily, like literally having to talk to myself like, okay, today, if it comes up, you're gonna mm. fight those negative feelings. You're gonna you're gonna you're gonna push forward. You're gonna pray. You're not gonna have a drink in the morning. You're not gonna, you know, you're not going to feel like you failed as a mother or as a wife. Like, I have all of these types of conversations with my, myself every, almost every single morning. And where I am now, there have been times in my life where I've been, like, really locked in. Yeah. And really praying and doing all the things that I need to do and doing all of the, you know, lemon water and tea and all. But there are times in my life, like now, where I'm trying to come out of a, I don't want to call it the dark space, but it's the space that I'm in. Mm. It's the space that I'm in. So there's not... I won't say it's a distrust. It's um, there's a level of imposter syndrome of how I present to the world, mm-hmm. but then there's another level of like, who the heck I really am on the other side of that. Mm-hmm. But then they're both beautifully valuable to the world. I once had a conversation with a friend. This was a few years ago, and because people always say, "Oh, you're so humble," and we were talking about that concept, and I really sat with that, and I'm like. Am I really that humble or am I just really that insecure? Ooh. People often say about you, Rashawn is so humble. And I believe you are. But is there a part of that that stems from insecurity more so than humility? Oh, yeah. I feel like there's a lot of uh, me who is still trying to believe that I belong at the table, still trying to believe that I have built a table and still wanting to be on the private plane on some of the Instagram posts that I see with other people who I know are doing equally the same that I'm doing. Yeah. Um, And I think that that's that's just me. And there's a level, there's a part of me that if I erase that part or if I really overcome that part, then who could I really be in this world? Because how about how I've shown up so far is like, Mm -hmm wow, she's dope, she does this. And I'm like, but what if y'all knew if I could get rid of that other stuff? I don't know who I would be. But there's a level of, I don't know what, I don't know where that comes from of why yeah. I can't, no, take that word out. I haven't allowed myself to fully be all of the, and this is even hard to say, the star that I am. And I don't even like saying the word celebrity or star Mm -hmm. or anything. That makes me feel like, who I'm a girl from Decatur, Georgia, from Southwest DeKalb High School. I've already prepared my speech when I get my award, big award, a televised award. I'm always going to thank Decatur because they did, Decatur and Atlanta has made me and shaped me. But part of that is like, when do you ascend, but also still show honor to that? Hmm. At the same, in the same breath. And I don't know how they both coexist. And I'm trying to be the person that allows them to both coexist, if that makes sense. It makes sense, but okay. I think sometimes you diminish where you are in order to compensate for that. Mm. Yeah. Almost like the girl who, like, wanted, like a John Morant, sort of, who 
got to keep his boys. Right, right. I'm still down, but over with, here, with I'm... my homeboy, I'm gonna, <laughs> not to that extreme. Yeah, absolutely. But is that a detriment to who I may become because I have kept it so real so long? Hmm. And I feel so horrible saying that because... Why? Well... That's all I've never ever known is humility. I've seen my parents. My dad is a you know the winningest coach in DeKalb County history. My mom was the one of the first executives at Emory Hospital in the social work department. She ran the social work department at Emory Hospital in the eighties. A black when they can still smoke cigarettes inside the building because my mama still smoke. <laughs> to this she day, to my, you know I love she, your I mama. Love you know I love your she, mama. Listen, but she had a corporate job in the eighties mm. at Emory Hospital. Okay, and my dad sending all these boys to college, to, to, to college on scholarships, you know. So I came from these humble beginnings. So yeah. all I knew is how to give. Okay. From myself, all I knew is all right, shine up, get these clothes together, we send them to the Salvation <laughs> Army. You know what I'm saying? Like that's what my mama did. That mm-hmm. and, and so uh, giving was a part of who I was, and so I feel like that's it's it's an obligatory act that mm-hmm. I have in my life to continue to give, and I don't know if that diminishes the other part of me because I, there's an obligation to continue to show up in the way that I'm giving, whether it's physical giving or like giving of myself. Mm-hmm. It's interesting you say giving of yourself because that's what I was going to kind of lean into. I'm like, giving is great. We should all serve, but I don't think it should be with the substitution of the greatness that you just exude because naturally you exude it. So to watch you at times for, kind of almost forcefully, okay, let me lock it. It, I can see it in your body. Yeah. Because I know you. Right. And speaking of greatness, I mean, there are people that would argue, Rashawn has it all. She has one hell of a career. Yep. She's a beautiful family. She's She seems settled. She's very much self-aware person. She's helped a lot of people, as you know. But what do you fear the most, with all of that said, right now in your life? What's your biggest fear? <laughs> My biggest fear is that I'm a fraud. My biggest fear is that I'm a fraud because of the things that I grapple with daily. I'm not, right now, in my time, right now, is like I'm not connected to my spiritual source like I want to be. Um, Physically, I don't feel like I am where I want to be, having come off competitions. So there's a there's a lot of body dysmorphia. Um, I'm eating and drinking more than I know that my, I know how my body responds to food mm-hmm. and alcohol. Mm-hmm. And I, I sat with my therapist and she was like, this is what we're going to do. And I did it for like a week. And I was good. <laughs> then the vacation came and then another vacation came. And I'm like, well, I am not going to not drink on the vacation. <laughs> I, that ain't me. That ain't how I feel. That, that ain't how I'm built. That ain't my thing. And then, but then it come back to the house. I was like, oh, I just want to be all right. And then it'd be like, just two, you know. And I don't, you know, we identified it. And I have to always be careful. And this is, I'm being very, very open and honest here. I have to, very be, care- I have to be very careful because I have um, alcoholism on both sides of my family. Mm-hmm. So I have to really be cognizant of making sure that I'm not dependent on those types mm-hmm. of things. Mm-hmm. And this might be more than I've ever said ever publicly, but yeah, I mean, I just have to like really be conscious. That's why I went to my therapist. I was like, no, I'm going to need you to come in. I, the pandemic is over in my mind-ish. Can I pay you extra to come sit on the couch? I need yeah. to see you in person. I need to help. I need you to help me. And so there's parts of me that I think need, I need someone to help me, like carry, like hold my hand and help me in my walk because I help so many people in their walk. Mm. I help so many people daily. From my family to people in my life. I speak so much life into people every single day. And then I get out the phone and I'm like, man, where is my person? Who's speaking into me, like really getting me all the way together? Like, bro. I mean, I do, my therapist is absolutely amazing, but she can't be with me every single day. I gotta do the work. You know what I'm saying? And I do the work. I be doing the work. And then I don't do the work. <laughs> what the, but that's the human condition. Human right? <laughs> we're, we're, not, we're not perfect. I and know. I, and I'm, I'm going to sit with perfectionism in a moment. Oh, yeah, because that, that's something I've dealt, I've dealt with my we're entire We're going to go there in a moment. Yeah, yeah. But I do want to ask you, 
Who stopped holding your hand? Who stopped holding my hand? Has anyone ever held it? You tell me. I don't know if, like, like I've had a, like, I mean, of course my friends and, but they have their own lives, but like someone, like I've never really had, like, I don't know, like, um, um, I've had mentors, but like mentors that have like really just, like held me like I've held a lot of people. A lot of this I've navigated like literally singularly because I'm a different type of talent. Like, I'm not just your one thing. I'm not just a sideline reporter. I'm mm -hmm. just not a CNN sports anchor. I'm, I'm not just a, a talk show host. I'm not just a podcaster. I'm a lot of things, and I'm so grateful to the universe yeah. and God, too, because I've, God has given me so many gifts. But it also is hard to mentor that, in a sense. And I'm an actor, mm -hmm. as well, an author. And a wife and a mom and a dog mom and all these things. Um, and for everyone who's poured into my life, this is not to discredit them yeah. at all. Because everyone has poured, the people that have poured into my life have poured into my life at the time that it needed to be poured into. Mm -hmm. But um, sometimes I wish I had a, a me for me. Yeah. Do you feel abandoned? No. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> just checks and balances. I just, I would love for someone to like just, and I know everybody got their own lives. And I keep going. But so that. do you. Yeah. But you found yeah, the time. But, but you got to find the strength to like push through. And then I generally do. Like I'm just at a point mm -hmm. where, where we're having this interview and I might look at, look back at this on in another year and be like, dang, you was really in the space. <laughs> you know what I mean? But you could, you, but at that time, because it's recorded and, and so many mm -hmm. people are going to see it, mm -hmm. like it's going to help somebody to see that someone who they may have looked up to, they may have seen places or one or two places like, oh, she got it all going on. And I do. But then I, then I don't. Then, and then I don't. You talk about getting through these moments in your life and pushing through. And I know that, you know, you're, you're an icon and a staple when it comes to radio. Oh, I know you hate it. Okay. Stop it, stop it, stop it. I know stop it. you hate it. But it's the truth. Um, <laughs> <laughs> with that said, though, you experienced... Let's just stick with radio for just a moment. Oh, my God. A lot of trauma v in radio, some of which you have not spoken publicly about. And I'm asking you to share. You don't have to share everything, but what you feel compelled to share because yeah. there are women like me who have experienced or are experiencing the good old boys club oh, yeah. or different things that happen, discrimination, whatever the case may be. There's black women watching you right now who are who aspire to be in radio, or who are in radio right now discouraged, ready to quit because somebody didn't share their story with them. Mm -hmm. So is there a part of your story that you're comfortable sharing when it comes to the trauma, but also the overcoming of that to where you sit now? Oh, I mean, listen, Radio shaped me as my foundation, and I always tell young journalists, and, and then even though radio is different now because we have the world of podcasts and we mm -hmm. have the world of, like, all of these things, but people who are true to the journalistic craft understand the power of radio, and that is truly my foundation. Everything starts from my radio background. Everything in my life starts from my radio background. But it was the thing that hurt me the most I've gotten fired from three radio stations. I've been on unemployment three times. Um, I have been literally burned, like literally walked out of radio stations like I never worked there before after being fired, after doing a shift, four-hour shift. Hey, can you come and see us? We need it. Three times. Two, Twice I got walked out. Like I was about to blow up the building. Um, one time that hurt me the, the most, Bailey is my older daughter, 
she is about to be a senior in high school. Mm -hmm. When I was pregnant with her, I went on maternity leave. And at the time, this is when Ryan Cameron had left Hot 107.9. He was at V103, or maybe he was still um, serving his um, Mm non-compete. But I was... Oh, no, he was there by the time, because I I was pregnant. So I was the lead of the morning show, the 18 morning show. I had to go on maternity leave. I literally left on a Friday, and I had Bailey on a Sunday. Mm. My last day was on Friday. So when six weeks had come up, the then uh, program director called me. He was like, hey, when are you you coming back? As I got a cat on my breast. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) <laughs> right. He said, I don't care. <laughs> Hurry up, get back. And I was like, um, I, 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 I no, nah, I'm not, I'm not. I like, I have more time. Because yeah. whatever it was, it may have been some accumulated time that added up that went beyond the six months, six weeks. Okay. So got a call from HR. They were like, that was wrong. Shouldn't have called you. It's against the law. Could have had a, a, like, that was the beginning of what could have been the beginning of a lawsuit. Um, so when I did go back, the afternoon guy who had filled in for me, or he, they had brought him to the show. He filled in for me, and so he was kind of leading the show. I got back, and he was still leading all the breaks, which I had been doing all that right, prior right. to me giving birth to my first child. So I was like, <laughs> he need to go on back the afternoons because I'm back. <laughs> I mean, I'm back. I mean, Smitty at home with the house. I'm, I'm pumping. Like, literally had a thing called a hooter hider. So I would literally put, I would be talking on a talk break, had a hooter hider, and I was literally pumping. Because I had it set up where you, I could pump my breasts and literally was, like, pumping milk while I'm doing breaks. And I remember after one show, after I'd come back, the program director was like, hey, we're going to go out to breakfast. I was like, all right, cool. Went out to breakfast, flying biscuit. And he was like, um... So Empress Cersei is going to lead all the breaks now. Like, wow. you, you're you no longer in the lead. And I was just like, I'm sorry. And this is when I was still, like, weak and meek and feeble, Rashawn. But something in me hmm. said, this is not right. And right. I was like, would we be having this conversation? And if I, had, if I had a penis, there was no rebuttal. So I called my uncle, who is a big-time entertainment, I'm not entertainment, labor attorney in the city. He worked for the mayor. He was very big, big uh, in the city. And I was like, do I have a case here? He was like, you totally have a pregnancy discrimination case. But do you want that to follow you your entire career? He was speaking from familial allegiance, mm-hmm. but also professional. Mm-hmm. But also as a man. So I could have had a million dollar case where I'd have been set But I actually decided not to file, and I sat there and let somebody else lead my show for an entire year. But I sat there and watched somebody else lead my breaks after I was, you know, the mother to an infant and had given everything to this station. And after about a year, that program, that current program director, that current program director was replaced by another one who immediately changed it because they knew. They yeah. knew that I was the, the the lead of that show. And it went back and things went well until Ricky Smiley came in. They were like, yo, we're doing the syndicated thing. Mm-hmm. You're going to middays. And then you everybody, you know, they, they switched everything up. But that's the story that I always try to tell because you got to fight for yourself. The new Rashawn would have been like, yes, draw up the paperwork. Let <laughs> we me go on the court. Millions and I'll see you in Cabo. <laughs> okay? I will see you in Cabo. Because I, cause I was worth that. I was worth that then. I was worth that now. Mm-hmm. But I didn't, you know, I just, you know, I didn't believe that it was worth fighting for. So how did the Rashawn that didn't believe that was worth fighting for, how did that carry on into the following years? Oh, I career? just was, I, that's when I started to like start feeling myself a little bit more. When I first had Carter, I was like 34 years old. And the 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 years after that, I was just like, oh, ain't nobody going to, like, when I and if I and I ain't going to ever do, you know, I started, like, having conversations with myself. And other women in radio, like, yo, man, you can't let that happen. You can't let that happen. Um, and you got to fight for yourself. And somebody is watching you. Some other young personality. I met two personalities yesterday. When we went to, we went out to, to eat. 
And I saw two young babies that are that are here uh, working at, at, at a station here in Atlanta. And I was like, hi, I'm Rashawn Ali. Oh, we know who you are. <laughs> you a legend. I'm like, thank you so much. I appreciate it. <laughs> but you just never know the way you show up in the world, have shown up in the world, yeah. how it has impacted people. Mm -hmm. And these babies probably were literally in preschool when they were listening to me on their way to preschool. You know what I mean? And I, I that's that's the, the moments that I love when I get those smiles of these little pretty babies. They're so cute, honey. And I just like, she's like, I'm DJ such and such. And I'm such and such. I'm like, oh, hey, baby. How you doing? Let me know if you need anything. You know, that is what makes me feel good because mm. I've... I've stood, I stood up for myself and I have, um, I made myself with God's guidance, like an upstanding personality, not just in Atlanta, not just in Georgia. Mm -hmm. I have made Say myself it. the shit. <laughs> there okay. you go. I mean, bleep that out, Katie Bo. <laughs> Keep that, Katie Bo. There's a level of me that still wants to be completely clean, but then yeah, there's a I'm level of me. you do it. Yeah, there's a level of me that wants to be like, well, turn up, sis. Because that's But that's me also too. who you are. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. I want to talk about Bailey and Carter a little bit. So let's do motherhood and then we'll move to we'll move to marriage. Because, you know, you talked about the pregnancy and how that impacted that situation in radio. But we've also had conversations just about the mother you were to Bailey mm -hmm. early on versus the mother you were to Carter yeah. in her early years. Mm -hmm. um, can you speak to that a little bit, if you don't mind? Yeah, Bailey uh, came, I was 31 when I got pregnant with Bailey. Um, and, you know, everything's exciting. You know, Brian and I come from literally the Huxtable life. My husband, Smitty, um, who a, a lot of people know him as Smitty, but, you know, we both come from two-parent homes educated he has a sister I have a brother like dog picket fence beautiful house great income like that 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 black life yeah that people aspire to have now we had it and still have both of our, both sets of our parents are still alive his sister has three children and is married to a, a cardiothoracic surgeon she's a therapist I'm married to a teacher and a track coach who's an incredible father. My brother's married to Dina, and they have beautiful girls. Like, we have what black life, when you want to you put a stamp on what black life looks life, like for African Americans, that's us. So that's what I wanted. So when I got to FAMU, I dated Cedric Carrington, great guy. He came from a two-parent home. Pole mark of the campus, thought I was gonna marry this baby, but he was a senior and I was a freshman. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> he had already done his stuff. <laughs> but then he locked me down, because I'm the cute girl from Atlanta, you know, looking like TLC, because back when in, in the 90s, the fall in the 93, we straight, straight oh, yeah. bobs, Jabot jeans, and Tommy Hilfiger shirts. But we would have, listen, the girls from Atlanta in Tallahassee, <laughs> baby, we, listen, we, we had our own thing down there. So I got locked down pretty early. But later on, you know, senior year, I was like, I need to do some things around here. <laughs> I love you, Sid. You know, you know, you're my dog. But you found out from your frat brothers what happened, right? So, so you just cheated on the man. I did, I did, I did. How many times? I, I, I don't know. We gotta talk about that. It was multiple. I mean, I, I, it was multiple times. It's okay I mean, now. You married? I am married. But it was, you know, we yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> he found out about it. It's fine. It's fine. So when I got back to Atlanta. All of these things. So I, I, Smitty and I kissed when we were freshmen. Mm -hmm. So I always had this idea because my parents met on a college campus. I was like, oh, my life ha has to be that way too. So I have to meet someone at least that I know mm -hmm. on a college campus mm. that I'm going to eventually marry. And that's just kind of how that thing went. And so we did the thing. We got, we, we, we got married. Uh, we started dating after mm -hmm. college, but we were so, we were close Prior to that, got married and did the whole thing. We're married three years and then we decided to have a baby. Literally the thing that people write in the books. Hmm. At least during that time, we did it. When I got pregnant and had Bailey, I was at the height of my radio career. I was the highest paid personality at Hot 107.9. Making money that I made at Sister Circle, which we'll get into later. Mm -hmm. Then, same salary, even more. Then... Wasn't no Uber, wasn't none of that stuff. So I'm doing club gigs, too. I had a personal driver. 
pick me up at like nine o'clock, would bring me back home at two. Would and this was prior to the baby, but then after the baby, I went back to the club because I think I suffer from postpartum in a different kind of way. I think there's different levels and degrees of postpartum. Okay, I didn't want to do all that, and I'm talking about do all that like actually be a mother. I'm ready to get back in the, in the club and get this money and be hot again. And Smitty mm. was at home with, with Bailey. Motherhood did not come easy for me. It wasn't all uh, baby powder and and, 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 and and baby lotion for me. No, it was not. It was not. It was not easy. I didn't embrace it. And that's it. I grew into it. I got better. Once my ass got fired, <laughs> and I had to be home, mm-hmm. and then I got pregnant with Carter three years later, mm-hmm. you know, two two years, ten months later, and 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 being in the latter part of Bailey's three third year of life, I was mm-hmm. like, oh wow, she is so sweet, she's so cute, and I loved her, but I did not, I was not attached to motherhood like that. And I think that we have to give ourselves a mission because, especially as black women, we're, we've always been maternal. We've had to nurse white slave masters' children mm-hmm. and bear them as well prior to us nursing them. You know what I mean? We've yeah. had to do all these things. Yeah. So black womanhood has always looked monolithic in some ways. Mm-hmm. Oh, They're going to be the nurturer. They're mm-hmm. going to do the things. They're going to do all the things. It didn't come like that for me. I got better with time. And I'm getting better. I'm still getting better. I'm not great. Good. You don't think you're a great mom? Nah, I'm all right. I have trouble. Mother, Mother's Day this year, I woke up crying. Why? Because I didn't, because I just, like, I'm just, I, am I getting this right? Am I getting this wrong? Like, the baby don't want to talk to me. Like, you know, it's like constant conversation of, like, because then you start comparing yourself. I'm like, wow, their relationship, that mother-daughter relationship is really nice. And, and this young lady got all these different organizations. And, and then I, and I, and I served. I have, I have a girl-serving organization. So you see the, the impact that you have had on other people's daughters. Ms. Rashawn, Ms. Jenny, and all of you have changed my life. I'm different because of you. And then you over here like, man, I can't get nobody to even talk to me in this house. So you're talking about that fight, that internal fight. Like, have I done everything? Have I implemented my program on my own daughters? <laughs> Mother's report card, A through F. What do you give yourself? <laughs> Boy, I'm about a smooth C. <laughs> <laughs> I give myself a B plus. B plus. Smitty would hate that. He hates when I talk about, like, he hates when I do that. Because he sees it. Mm-hmm. And how much I do give and, and, and how much, uh, you know, how good of a mother I am, but I'm hard on myself in every facet of my life. So I, I would say, I would say a B plus. A B plus. So I want to, you talked about Mother's Day and I want to read part of a Mother's Day card that Bailey wrote you since you, you know, for whatever reason, that's tussling with being a good mom. But part of what she says was, I want to thank you for the past year and how much courage it took you to un- unenroll me at AIS, which is her previous school. I know you were scared about it, too, and it was a big step for all of us. But as we have come to learn, it was definitely for the better. And when I read that, there was such a sense of team, but also emotional connection. Your baby is very connected to you emotionally. And it's interesting that you still tussle with impact when she's liter- she literally reads your heart. So with that in mind... What is it? What does it mean to you? Is there any solace you feel oh, in absolutely. your daughter talking to you this way after you wake up crying, questioning if you're a good mom? Or oh not? yeah, I mean it came right. God knows what you need and the time you needed, and I totally needed that. I mean Brian was like, Smitty was like, man, you we great. And he's in high school. He's a high school teacher. He's like, what I see every day and what we have, you have zero to worry about because he's he's in the trenches. He's in the trenches with these. Girls and their in the, their, their relationship with their mothers and these boys and their relationship with their fathers and mothers. He's in the trenches, so he was like, "We needn't worry." 
and he don't even speak like that. We needn't. <laughs> I promise you, we good over here. But those are the things that I just, you know, I have to continue to do. But it does bring me solace. And then Carter gave me a card too, and she wrote it all out. And it was all cute or whatever. Um, but you know, I, you know, I think you know a lot of it has to do with you know my own relationship mm -hmm. with my mother, which grew. You know, I think after high school and going into college, mm -hmm. mom was very corporate. You know, she, um, my mom's a Philly girl. Like, you know, things were like, this is what we're doing, you know, yeah. very. And so the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. I don't care, you know, where you are in your life. And so I'm like, I don't, you know, I want to make sure that I'm still giving them that love, that, mm -hmm. that juju, you know, that they that they need. And my mom gives me that too, but you know, you take you take everything around you, you say, This is what I'm gonna do, mm -hmm. this is what I'm not gonna do, this is how I'm gonna do this better. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'm just like, I hope I'm doing it better. So your measure of good motherhood is is based somewhat upon you not inflicting the same feelings on your children that you felt towards your mom at a certain point in your Ooh. life. Moving on. Yep, 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 yep. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. At, at a certain point, yeah, of course. And I think that's that's you know, I think that's the um, people don't talk about this out loud, especially with black mothers and and daughters. They don't talk about it out loud. It's one of those hidden things because if we say it out loud, then we look like the bad daughter. So I'm very careful around all of that. Do you think your mom's proud of you? Yeah. Oh, she's my biggest fan. I think she loves me more than anything and anybody in the world. With I that know she love, does. Do you think? Well, I mean, my daddy too, but I think she loved me more <laughs> than anybody think, in the world. Do you think with that love also comes her potentially being your biggest critic? In that? Oh, absolutely. And then I find myself doing the same thing with my daughters. I have to tell myself, when she comes downstairs, if you don't like what she has on, just don't say nothing. <laughs> if you don't like her hair, just don't say nothing. Real conversations with myself, and sometimes it comes out. Just this past weekend, we were at a we, we were going to a an event, and she came down. Bailey came downstairs, and the thing wasn't zipped up, and all this was all out. I was like, she was like, "Can you help zip me up?" I was like, "Yeah." She was like, "You ain't say anything about if I look cute or nothing." I was like, "It's fine. <laughs> Everything's fine." <laughs> But, you know, I remember, like, being on the sideline, like, uh, when I was at CBS Sports Network, and I think, like, I had my jacket was a little tight, right? And my button was kind of, you know, and I remember getting a text from my mom. I'm, like, literally in the middle of, I don't even know where I was, covering a, a, a football game. Unlooting, unloosing your button. <laughs> Not nothing about the hit, if it was a good hit or nothing. I was just like, she's just talking about my button. <laughs> but then, again, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. I find myself doing those same things. So I have to constantly talk to myself about that. And I think as mothers, you know, there's some amazing moms out there mm -hmm. that are just killing it. And I be looking, and I say I be, the proverbial be. Yes, I did. I know it's grammatically incorrect, whatever. But you have to be your own version of motherhood right. for your children. And... I have to constantly tell myself that. Okay, can we move on from motherhood? <laughs> <laughs> I no. see your nervous energy. It yeah. is. It is it's a you lot. You get a little squirmy. It is, and I think it's a conversation that um, I would love to moderate with other women. Of course you actually, would love to moderate. <laughs> but not, like, talk about it myself. Okay. A lot. Okay, it's eight C grade, mom. <laughs> C grade. I mean, I'd be B plus. I'll give you an A, but that's just... A minus. But... Why do you want to lower your grade that I'm giving Maybe you? Maybe you'll be living in my house. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody else walking in your house, oh, this is the Cosby show. Yeah, I mean, they could look at that. It is. It's great. They have great. They, everything's great. I mean, for the most part, it's really good. They have every, they have everything they need and, and definitely what they want. Okay, let's talk about marriage. Let's talk about Smitty for a minute. That's a good guy there. Um, you talked about your love story a little bit, but there's been a lot of conversations with people lately. I don't know what's in the water, but people are being becoming more open about just what their setup is in their marriage. Mm. 
Who's paying the bills and oh. who's not? 50-50 here. Who's doing this and who's doing that? We're just in a we're in a time now where people are really opening up about their setup in their home. Air quotes. What has the journey been like for you and Smitty for you to be the person in the public eye? Oh and my. for him not to be. How have you maneuvered through that? And we do have time. You don't have to look at your Apple Watch. We love you, Smitty. <laughs> Uh, that is, um, that is, you know, that, that is, at, at one point it was very tough, like, you know, early on, just trying to figure out who I was. See, so, so I come from a middle class home and a lot of things in my early adulthood, but I've always been a good student. I've always been very active, ac um, athletically and academically. So I got a lot of awards and things mm -hmm. I, um was given accolades like throughout my entire life. So I'm used, used to praise. I'm used to praise. I'm used to it. Right? right? And attention. Yeah. So a lot of stuff early on I didn't have to like really fight hard for. It just was there. Mm -hmm. Smitty taught me how to fight. He taught me how to work hard for things. But the but the the crazy part about it is when I started working hard for things in my career, he was like, Man, you doing too much at one point. And I was. Mm -hmm. And I remember coming home one day. This was before children. He was like, man, you give the whole world Rashawn Ali, but I just can't even get a piece of Rashawn when you come in this house. Mm. I was like, ooh, body blow. Body blow. And I couldn't even, I had to figure out, like, how do I balance this thing out? And early on, I remember we were at an event, and... <laughs> We were at the bar area, and because I talked about him a lot, he's a very private person. Mm -hmm. So I referred to him as Smitty on the radio, and people were like, Smitty, 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 and he was just like, this is a lot. Like, <laughs> and then somebody said, Mr. Ali, to him. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Ali? <laughs> First of all, for people who know me, that is actually my middle name. Rashawn right. <laughs> Ali is my given name. There's no stage name. Mm -hmm. I didn't make this up. My daddy gave me the name Rashawn Ali. My maiden name is Godfrey. But for somebody like my husband, who didn't like the limelight, right, right. said, Mr. Ali, <laughs> it took about 10 years for him to come back out with me. Because I wow. was like, you know what, babe? Don't worry about it. I got it. I'm just gonna go. So I went. A lot of people. It was it was a running joke for a lot of people in the industry. Like we don't never see your husband. We don't, we don't ever see your husband. And I stopped asking him to go because I knew innately that all of this was uncomfortable for him. Yeah. And I remember Ryan Cameron telling, asking him, when we first got in this business, when when I first got in the business, are you ready for this? Are you ready for this? And he was like, Yeah, I'm great. It's fine. Mm. But you don't know what you don't know, because as my star began to brighten from being Ryan Cameron's sidekick to being the lead of my own morning show. Yeah. To not really being able to walk around a Falcons game. This was prior to social media. They just, I, just, I remember I was like, oh, I think I might be, this might be a lie. <laughs> we were walking around the, the, the Falcons game. It was me, Griff, and CJ, and we couldn't move. I was like, oh, this is, this is what they talking about. This is the thing that I always wanted. I've always mm -hmm. wanted to be in the limelight since I was three. Always wanted, I always wanted the light. That's when I knew. But that was different from my house. So mm -hmm. I had to learn how to be, had to bring that thing down. Not bring it down, but just like, because all it is, these lights, all these amazing people, I love everybody in here. Even the people I just met yesterday. What's that? That house? That is what's going to be who it's about at the very end and the beginning. So once I got that, yeah. once I understood that, and I started shifting how I moved, not putting this school, this school um, appearance, that school, and a lot of the, most of those things in the beginning, I wouldn't get no money for you put in the work as a radio personality. That's what, that's what people miss now. 
because everything's so fast paced. Yeah, you, know, like you can get it. You can get it. You put you pull up pull up your your, your, your microphone. You got a podcast and you're good. Mm-hmm. That art of radio of going and being entrenched in the community. I've got I've got grown women and men. You came to my second grade class when I was at Columbia Elementary School, or you came to my fifth grade class and you told me this. There was a girl I met in the third grade. She eventually became an AKA. So you came to my class and you told me, we need more women in science. Well, I just want you to know, I never forgot that. I'm in my third year of dentistry school. Hmm. Those are the stories that make me realize that you had to put that time yeah. in. But I put a lot of time in over here. And I took a lot of time away from it. But once I found that balance, that's when we got into a groove. Speaking of groove, how do you... That was a long answer. But it was good, though. Okay.